uh, we're so lucky to have Sarah Abrahamson in person. Uh, she's a Janelle alum, uh, and for many reasons, really. And but uh, she did her masters at the KTH in Stockholm, and then moved to uh, Sam to California to do her PhD with, with Mats Gustafsson and got her PhD at uh, UCSF and Berkeley, and then uh, followed Mats here, and um, then uh, did her postdoc in Rockefeller. Um, working on C. elegans and um, worked with us at the Transcription Imaging Consortium a lot on the second generation phase gratings, um, which she makes herself. She went, you went to Cornell Nanofab to make your own gratings, right? And we have, I think they're all made here from you by hand. So it's amazing. And uh, now she's a professor at uh, UC Santa Cruz. And thank you so much for being here in person. Thank you for having me. That's uh, it's uh, almost correct. I didn't move to San Francisco to do a PhD. I was just going to be there for three months and do a master's thesis, and then they tricked me. They and tricked they tricked you. me to stay and do a PhD, and then I was tricked into a couple of postdocs, and then I was tricked to take a faculty position at UC Santa Cruz, and none of this is my fault. <laughs> it just happened. Uh, and it's so good to be back here. It's beautiful. I have my old roommates in the audience. I have favorite old colleagues in the audience. It's, it's absolutely wonderful. So I'll talk a little bit about the times that have been and all the instrument development that I have been so lucky to be able to do. It's been really, really fun. Uh, the focus of my research has been that the world is alive and three-dimensional. And we need to see things three-dimensionally if we are going to study biology in certain, uh, certain ways. Uh, there's many smart tricks to do to try to extract 3D information from 2D using all kinds of statistics. They're great. They're not always enough. So uh, what I've been doing is, is to do optical systems design and invention for 3D microscopy. And uh, this, you see some, some familiar faces here. We have Carrie still here at Janelia, who's posing with the Gustafsson lab. Uh, it's Vieto and Hesper and me, and uh, usually I've leaned in a little in late because she doesn't know if they are now. Uh, but it's a long, it's a long time of, of um, developing. And wh why do we do this? We do this because we need to develop new imaging technology just to advance the field of optics and keep optics happening. We need to deliver a unique and tailored imaging capability, and we need to disseminate that. And I think the dissemination is the hardest part, honestly. It's uh, very, very difficult to build a custom built microscope. Janelia tries to have some microscopes here that are custom built. That's great, but what really needs to happen in the end is commercialization. Um, so we can get a lot of things in microscopy. We can get 3D volumes, we can get high resolution, we can get super resolution, we can get high speed, we can have living cells, we can have all kinds of things, but we can probably not have all of this at the same time. So I always describe when I teach that microscopy is an unfortunate series of compromises. So the kind of imaging that I design systems for is high speed, high resolution 3D imaging, and that requires strong signal, sensitive detection, a lot of custom build optics. Uh, I do a lot of diffractive Fourier optics, a lot of data management and analysis. And this is really, really expensive and it's really difficult. And I'm very glad to see that Janelia now is moving in the direction of a lot of data analysis, a lot of deep learning. My former PhD student, Dr. Eduardo Hirata Miyazaki, just took the class at Woods Hole in deep learning and he was amazed and he loved it. And we're so grateful that, that um, Major Jemai and Genie are doing that course. So we construct these wonderful, amazing systems. It takes a lot of time alone in the dark room listen to a lot of good music. Um, we do nanofabrication of diffractive optics. It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, as Brian said, I got to learn this at Cornell. So I designed these optics and nobody knew if, nobody could tell me if it was possible to make them. So I called the Cornell Nanofab because they were supposed to be the best. And they had this little conference call every Friday. And when I asked if I could make this, everyone started laughing. So I was still at uh, UCSF at that time, <clears throat> and uh, and uh, yeah, we didn't have the money to to send me there for a year and to to learn how to do that and develop those methods. But thankfully, later on at Rockefeller, um, Corey gave me the money to do that, and it was great. And now I've trained a couple of students in the fab at Santa Barbara, because now I'm in California, and. These open facilities like CNF at Cornell and the nanotech facility at UC Santa Barbara and more facilities, 
they're funded by uh, the whole uh, uh, international uh, sorry the national uh, nnim national nanotechnology infrastructure project which is not really running anymore and now there's the chips act to bring semiconductors back up um, but it's a fantastic resource for for open for academic and private companies to come in and, and learn how to do this it's set up to do semiconductors we did it on glass it was a little different um, but it was um, we could really see all the development that we see now in consumer products like thermal sensors the pixels for that are developed in some of these fabs right so bespoke microscopy commissioning this is what Janelia does also we build the system we try to make a really nice box around it so that users can be happy and actually actually um, make uh, biology happen with this and do biological research. This is really hard. A lot of these things take realignment. I think the system that I built at Janelia had to be taken down because nobody was able to maintain it. So again, I'd like to stress that commercial uh, companies need to, need to really build these systems, make them robust, make them usable. And that's, that's a really big challenge. I've struggled with that. Um, SAIS in Vienna offered to commercialize my system but that was on the condition that I moved there full time. Ari here is a master of this. He's actually commercialized microscope. He's a hero. That's what everybody needs to do. We all need to be more like that. Um, but what we can do um, today is uh, we can have truly simultaneous 3D imaging. And I'm going to go through that, although it's not quite the right audience for it here, because I know a lot of people in the audience who then I know that they already know how to do this. Um, but I'm going to do it anyway, and I'm going to talk about the 2D image, right? So we, we see the world, and the world is three-dimensional, but because of our fantastic depth of focus with the very small aperture of our pupil, we, uh, we can get like 3D projection of that 3D world. So that is, in, in a sense, that is 3D information. But we can't discern anything in that view. So even if we take a really extended focus image in our microscope of our cell, we just get everything in one 2D plane. So what do we do? We, we look at different focal planes at different times. So that we do by opening the aperture. So for those of you who are amateur photographers with actual cameras and not with cell phone cameras, you know that when you open the aperture, you get a very short depth of focus. And in the microscope, of course, that becomes extreme with a numerical aperture, which is almost 180 degrees and you have a 500 nanometer focus depth. So, we can scan through focus to get a 3D view of something, but if something moves too fast, um, we are going to have a little bit of movement without that stack. So the question that Mats gave me in San Francisco all of those years ago was, you know, can we collect that whole focal stack in one shot without sacrificing resolution? So people had tried to kind of do that before uh, with the light field, with beam splitters, those methods always lose some of the resolution, one due to light field due to just the layout of the system and the beam splitters due to aberrations, which could be corrected. Um, then the more interesting and fun and crazy project I thought was uh, what uh, Dr. Greenaway in, in Edinburgh had done. He had taken just a grading. I think it was an amplitude grading maybe it was, and he put that into a system and he saw if you take a Fresnel lens and do that in the Fourier plane, you get a multiplexing of the beam and you get a refocus. So that was the original idea. And I, I flew over there and talked to him and I said, yeah, but you know, it's not useful. We get chromatic dispersion, we get all these problems. Uh, but uh, you know, if you can really harness the wave nature of light, you can actually do anything with diffractive optics. You have complete control over everything. If you put a diffractive device in the Fourier plane, you can control the waveform any way you want. And uh, so what I've done is with this little diffractive optic, we do that, that simultaneous 3D stack. So that's uh, at the fab at Cornell uh, on a glass wafer, etched little gratings um, that multiplex and refocus light. So step one here, if we wanna make this simultaneous focus stack, right? We wanna take a whole 3D stack in one shot at the same time. We take this grading and we put it in the Fourier plane of the microscope. So what's going to happen now? If I, put a, if I take a grading here and I, I shoot my laser pointer through it, this is the point. I put it through the grading, I get multiple points. Now I take an image in a microscope and I put this guy in the microscope, I get multiple images. 
So I don't lose any resolution during this because I put it in the Fourier plane. And the Fourier plane contains the whole frequency support, spatial frequency support of that image. I just split the light up, so I lose some signals. Now, if I design this grading right, I can build a camera sensor with, say, nine pixel space. So that was the first attempt I did. And so we have a picture coming in, and we put this little optic in the Fourier plane of the microscope with the back focal plane of the objective, and we multiplex it in like that. So why does it look like that little goblet? That is because this pattern, this grading function, generates a fan out array of three by three spots. Um, and this is a binary phase grading. It means it's completely transparent. It's not an amplitude grading that transmits and blocks light. It's a phase grading made of glass that just has stair steps in it. And this algorithm here, the pixel flipper, I'll show it running here. So this is, uh, I'm, I'm horrible at software development, right? I'm an engineer from the Royal Institute of Technology and I can't program, but I can program in MATLAB. So I wrote this in MATLAB. Uh, this original program took a week to run for full resolution on an old Mac laptop in plastic. And now it runs like that, right? But you only need to run this once at full resolution. So you see, this is a zero first, 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 zero minus one, minus one, minus one orders. So the 2D set of diffractive orders. And that little binary phase grading, so it's a step in the glass here. That's not, I've shown it at the black here. I don't know how to represent the phase grading really well. Um, <clears throat> that's what you do to get that fan out array. Uh, and you can download this algorithm. It's part of oops, one of our publications. Um, and you can generate anything. You can make a little picture. My, my Japanese student made a little Pokemon coming out when he shines it through the grading. So it's really pretty. I didn't get one, unfortunately. Uh, he only made one. Uh, <laughs> So if you want more efficiency, um, you can put multiple phases in here. And uh, so we have a multi-layer grading here with eight stair steps. So that took a lot of money and a lot of time in the fab for me. Uh, it brings you from 67 to 89% photon count efficiency. And at Benilia, people really encourage me to do this because they figured that, you know, that, that multiplies with every other loss in your system. And it, it, and it's really beautiful and, and clean room work is really fun if you have the energy for it. And I certainly did at the time. Um, so that was the multiplexing. And now we are going to distort this grading. So this is a periodic grading in the Fourier plane. We have a collimated beam coming in here uh, because we're imaging the primary focus here. And if I put a periodic grading here, the grading, um, the diffraction angle here and here and everywhere is going to be the same. Now, what happens if I distort that? So I put a coarse period here, over here, and a fine period here. And we remember that if you have uh, an obstruction for light, and that obstruction is tighter, it's going to squeeze the light more. It's going to diffract the light more. Um, just like that. So fine, fine period, large diffraction angle. Um, and what happens with the beams then is that the beam that goes upward here and has a larger angle here than here, it's going to start to diverge from being a collimated beam. So that's going to introduce a focus shift. What's going to happen to the beam that goes down? The exact opposite is going to happen. So that beam is going to start to converge. And if we calculate this right, we can actually make an aberration free refocusing function for each plane here in the sample. So now what we get from our single image is a multiplexed image with the focus steps attached. That is a function of the 2D diffraction order. So you do a little bit of math and you calculate what exactly is the distortion in X and Y that you need in order to pro pro produce that uh, refocusing function. And I base that calculation on the Abbe-Sign condition and out of focus phase error from the Abbe-Sign condition. And here you go, you have a distortion of your original grading pattern that produces this. Now, uh, usually when I get there, somebody raises their hand and says, Sarah, that's actually not gonna work. And then I know they can do it. Uh, or that they got really good at that, just working with, with, as an engineer. And, and that is chromatic dispersion. So this is the album cover for the Pink Floyd Dark Side of the Moon. And it, it's actually refraction. So dispersion in, uh, in a diffractive device is 10 times stronger than that. So what you get, even in green lights, you get this green rainbow out. 
And so you need to correct that. And that was probably the hardest part of this. And that's the reason that people don't really use diffractive optics, despite diffractive optics being so fantastic. You can multiplex beams, any orientation you want. You can control the wave from. Why is not everybody using this? And the answer is, of course, chromatic dispersion. So um, one way to fix that is you can put a different grading in. So here we have that smear that happens. We have 500 nanometers and 530 nanometers, the typical GFP spectrum, and, and you get a smear out. So you put in another grading here, right? Brilliant. So it completely removes the dispersion. We have the same nominal period as this grading. And uh, unfortunately, if you put the single lens here, everything goes back to the center. So then you have to do a little more. So, so then you say, okay, we're gonna put in a prism and you make this beautiful nine faceted prism and put it in there. And now we're there. So this, this is actually it. So here we have the grading in the Fourier plane. We have the diffractive orders. We have a grading and we have prism. And then we got our lens. So that works great. Um, and uh, Max, uh, who is no longer with us, who's a fantastic mentor and scientist, um, gave me eight years to do this project as a PhD student. It took a long time. It was really, really hard, but it really works. Um, yeah, so those of you who are, if there are any PhD students listening, at least you haven't done an eight-year PhD yet, hopefully. Max uh, did a 12-year PhD, by the way, if anyone's interested in, uh, in the particle physics. Uh, so here we come to some of the people in the room here were a part of this when we did a little bit of transcription imaging here at Genelia to proof of concept this system. So we looked at yeast centromeres, and I, I honestly think this is the ultimate system to study this transcription. Uh, you get the view of full resolution in the cell nucleus. If you want to, you can add a little bit of localization. You can add some astigmatists to super localize these guys. Uh, it's it's kind of beautiful. Um, um, here's polymerase two. It's all Genelia data. You guys, um, it was fun times being here and doing that. Um, then uh, when Max passed away, I uh, I was kind of stranded here, and uh, Corey Bargman reached out after after um, David Degard at UCSF called her and said, "Okay, Sarah, you can come to my lab." And Jerry Rubin was fantastically generous and gave me funding to continue this project and even tried to keep some of the instruments here. Um, but I came into the world of the nematode C elegans. Uh, and here they are. And we tried to do some neural circuit function imaging on the multifocus microscope. Uh, but you know they got a lot of neurons here, right? This is much more than a single cell nucleus with a few transcription factors in it. Um, so the idea here was that, OK, we need to make it bigger. And I said, sure, it's super easy to make it bigger. We just make another grading function, right? So now we get it. 25 same grading function here that's going to generate 25 images. Uh, so I built that system just for fun to try it with a laser line filter in it to limit the fluorescence. <laughs> Don't do that. It's going to bleach really fast. You have one nanometer of your spectrum. Uh, but it was really simple. And, and there's actually a point to that that I really wanted to make. And I think this video is not. No, it is playing. It's just slowly. They're moving slowly here. And it's going to be fast. Bright field microscopy and all types of labeled free imaging, I think they will come back because this has been a golden time of work in microscopy for long enough that we know that this takes a lot of life. I mean, it's got great specificity, but with all these new deep learning methods, you can analyze data in a completely different way. And, and here's the little developing embryo. I mean, developing embryos are really sensitive little guys. So I think this is this is a very big sensitive system. And I honestly think that it's one of the points of this microscopy modality because most other really fast scanning methods like scape, it's only fluorescence, right? This is bright field and fluorescence. And uh, I did some polarization imaging with Rudolf Oldenburn. There's not only polarization, there's uh, now quantitative space is becoming kind of big. So I, th I think this is a very interesting application. And then it, the imaging system is super simple, right? You take, take this little grading, and you put in two relay lenses and you move your camera back and there you are, it's done. You don't need the chromatic dispersion correction, all of that stuff. Uh, but of course you also want to be able to do fluorescence. So this is what that could look like. It's a completely new layout for chromatic dispersion correction in imaging. Uh, we got a camera array with blazed gratings on it. Uh, <clears throat> it's still in preparation for publication. Don't ever let your students graduate before publication because they actually don't have time for it. You know, they really don't. After they take a job, even if it's in uh, you know, academia, like Ed is at the BioHub now, 
they really won't have time to finish that. And you know, the data analysis for this, I couldn't bring it out. So that was not possible for me. So if you remember the old design, we had this, this prism in it, and we had this diffraction grading, and we had a lens here. Now we don't need that prism. And that prism was expensive, and it's beautiful. And making a 25 plane prism like that is probably not really reasonable. So, and this, this is now the new solution. So you have a camera array, tiny CMOS cameras, um, 25 of them, you can make 15, you can make 25, you can make 50, whatever you want, right? And then instead of the prism, you just, in every lens, you know, the lens has a mount that has a filter mount, the filters for like UV filter, yellow filter, for photographers, right? You put this filter on. Now everybody puts digital filters on instead, and I think you should both do both. Uh, so you put that blaze grading here, and that completely corrects the dispersion. It's absolutely smashingly simple and beautiful. You cut the little gratings out with a laser cutter when you made them, and they're circular and fit in the holder. Uh, we've already, before publishing this note, gotten requests from other labs saying, hey, could we use this? We do another diffractive Fourier typography kind of thing. And the answer is, yeah, you just do exactly the same thing, and you pop it into your system, and anything that multiplexes a beam and, and shows multiple images you can use it for you don't need to use this grading to refocus you can just use it to multiplex maybe you want to have polarization maybe you want to have all kinds of things here so so i think this is beautiful and i think it, it will get used and uh, the person who got to build this was uh, my first PhD student eduardo hidrata miyazaki and uh, yeah here's the camera array just the inside here is a little CMOS camera or CCD camera, depending on which one you choose for your particular scope, depends on how fast versus how sensitive versus how much dynamic range you want. Because as you may have noticed, if you buy a CMOS camera with really small pixels, like the C4 micron pixels, your dynamic range is next to nothing. And once you have enough signal here, you can saturate it. So we go with the Sony IMX just with a little bit bigger pixel sizes. Then you screw in your lens the camera lens and in the filter cap here you put that little grating so you see a little bit of uh, so this is re aberration free refocusing across 50 micrometers if you've tried to do uh, refocusing uh, this is really amazing we had to try it twice because the first time we didn't get the refractive index matched quite right so we had a little bit of of spherical aberration here in the end, but this really works. It's absolutely beautiful. I am so glad that Ed got to do this and got it working. Um, the tracks and beams, of course, the track beams, especially when you're running 25 cameras at the same time at 160 hertz. Uh, <clears throat> so we did some proof of concept imaging at uh, uh, Woods Hole. So Woods Hole is one of my favorite places in the world. Um, it's absolutely amazing. There are the greatest people ever there. They're just giving you your sample. You know, here we got lamprey, we got zebrafish, we got sea elegans. This is the very first movie Ed ever took um, with the Gal Haspel and Jennifer Morgan at MBL. And uh, then he does this depth coding. This is a panorama line. We can pretty much see every neuron in there. Uh, of course, it, things are going to bleach because you're taking a 25 plane focal stack in wide fields. So you're not going to have a very long imaging if you're going to image this fast. All the time. Um, muscle activity here, uh, myosin, GFP, uh, sorry, GCAMP, uh, looking at the, the, how the muscle signal when the core moves, because a lot of people have done like a spinal cord and, and things like that at MDL. So that's it. And then, oh, we have Thomas Graham came down from Saviedra Sachs lab at Berkeley and threw some Drosophila on the scope too. And so then we could look at some bright field and some and fluorescence and that's the little heart cells in the developing larva so that was pretty also and there's of course a user interface for this monster microscope so they the kids wrote that in apari um, so that you can look at those 25 images while you set your focus and your exposure and all of that stuff uh, i think uh, i was supposed to talk for about half an hour and i think i have uh, should we open for questions or should we say a few words about multi-focus in? I think we have time for a few more words. All right, we'll just take a few more. So this is one of my favorite data sets. It's by Lin Xiao. Um, so this is more Genelia imaging. It's a uh, live uh, sim, um, 20 seconds per frame. 
that was in the early days. Now we're at 20 frames per second. And as you know, SIM improves both 3D resolution and contrast. Um, it's based on spatial frequency mixing. This method was developed by Mats when we were still at UCSF. And thanks to Janelia, I got the money to build these beautiful imaging systems and have uh, two students and two postdocs and really make that happen. Um, imagery construction used to be a big hurdle for SIM, but since Marcel Miller wrote Fair SIM, that is not a problem anymore. You now have free open source software in ImageJ to do your SIM data reconstruction. Um, the problem with SIM is that it takes a little while to take every time frame, because for 3D SIM you need 15 frames. For 2D SIM you actually only need nine. Uh, so it can go really fast. A frame at frames at 25 hertz. Uh, beautiful 100 nanometer resolution. This is the, the two sister strand of the mouse spermatocytes in a Nemo complex. Um, this is how many images you need to take nine focal planes, 135 images. So for those of you who do localization microscopy, you might say, oh, 100 images, nothing. We image for a week, we take thousands of images, but we want to do this live, right? So we got to make time stand still somehow. And what we do is we put the 3D sim together with the MFM. And it, it really is a little bit interesting because um, you need to scan the sample through the beam unless you scan the beam through the sample. So my student actually tried scanning the beam through the sample. I don't know if he'll get to the point where he will finish it and publish it, but you can do that. It was Lin Xiao's idea. Um, but you build a system and either you scan just three times instead of you know all of those 135 times. Um, and, and it looks kind of beautiful. Um, Synoponemal complex in C. elegans is kind of my favorite sample. So here it is live uh, recording uh, and doing SIM on it. And uh, that was a sample from Didi Bala's lab in, uh, at UC Santa Cruz. We're looking at two different uh, proteins here, uh, patch two and HGP3 in the complex. This is still dead because, and it's actually because the sample prep doesn't really develop for, for, for live imaging yet. Uh, so we, that's the problem that really needs to be solved. But proof of concept, that's it. Of course, people love to image act in with SIM. So my collaborator in Stockholm, Jalmar Brismar, his student, Maximilian Selfliaven, who built one of these copy of this system is, is imaging some actin and some mitochondria and whatnot. We'll see how that goes. And uh, yeah, my, my take home message from all of this is just, we need commercial microscopes, we need commercialized technology. So those of you who work with that, be very proud and know that uh, that's how you really make these advances in optics, these fundamental advances actually useful and applicable to people. I've tried to custom build these systems in a few places and I'm never going to do it again because it's a lot of work. And once you leave, somebody will drop something and think that they can realign it themselves and they can't. So, so that's uh, that's my message. And then a big thank you again for having me here. It's really cool to visit and look forward to meeting with all the old colleagues again. Maybe I should start. Um, so what, what is the bottleneck? If you, if you don't, if, you, if you're not having a commercial microscope vendor, what is the bottle? Is it the making the face grading? No, or? it's the alignment. It's the alignment yeah. itself. It's the robustness of the alignment. And so who else can make those face gradings now? Because I think NIST, we, we tried with NIST, right? And we had issues with NIST uh, for the oh, eight phase. cannot do this. <laughs> NIST Maryland is a different story. Uh, no, 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 you do, you no. But uh, so for example, if you wanted one, what do you, if you wanted just one, uh, you would call me and we will set up a call with UC Santa Barbara mm -hmm. and Demis, who works there as an engineer, uh, he quoted us to make one of the, the blazed gratings even, which is the hard one, which is takes the ASML stepper and DPV lithography, not just reactive ion etching on a binary mask for $10,000. That's not a lot of money for that part. And the thing about that is that if you buy one, if you buy 10, it's about the same price. Uh, so, so engineers in good clean rooms, can, can do those things. Uh, Cornell and Santa Barbara are two of the best, but they're also commercial companies. Uh, and really like a lot of universities, it depends on which grading you want, right? If you just want the binary face grading, you order from a company, any company, a mask. So the mask is a glass piece here, 
which is a few millimeters thick. It's, uh, it's got a chrome sputter layer on it. And then you etch the chrome away so that you can put that piece. And then, so then that you can buy, right? So this you can buy. That's the amplitude grading. So you want to make this into a phase grading. Then what you need to do is you take this piece, you put it into a reactive ion etcher. My favorite etcher is the Oxford 80 etcher. And you put plasma on it. And then you put it in a bath and strip the chrome and there you are. So you etch down the glass. If you want the multi-layer optics, it is a little harder. You need to be in a place where there is a stepper. Stanford also has a stepper, for example. Berkeley has a stepper. Uh, but Stanford is, there's a lot of students. It's kind of dirty. It's kind of not easy to work there. Uh, Berkeley is only interested in commercial companies. Ah, so that's the place where you would buy it. Yes. Because they just want to make money, honestly, the guy who runs that fab. It's beautiful fab and it's really clean and it's really nice, but uh, they, they don't have an interest in training students or academic projects. So yeah, but yeah, forget about Canadians from West. <laughs> we went out there. I mean, first of all, you need to go through the safety safety check, background safety check for a federal place. It took about a year for me. Uh, and then they had that data breach, so they stole my social security number and credit card number. But then happened at least ten of those years. But yeah, uh, commercial companies can can make these. There are a few, but the alignment is hell. Hold on, on, uh, hold on, so that uh, everyone can hear you. Hi, great talk. So, what's the uh, volumetric range that you can image simultaneously, either the nine or the twenty-five plane? So and we, what's limiting? We don't know actually because we didn't hit the limit yet. We thought we were going to hit the limit with this guy here. We thought that we would hit the limit with fifty microns. Um, what usually limits us practically is that it's really hard to make a big lateral field of view. The biggest we made was one hundred and twenty by one hundred and twenty micron. If you want to go bigger than that, it gets kind of tricky, given that you want to fraction limit the resolution, right? So for me, coming from Matz's lab, where everything had to be super resolution and compatible with SIM and whatnot, it's like, I will never compromise resolution, but that's like kind of stupid, right? Because sometimes you actually want to undersample, you want to do all these things. So, so that's so far, that's 120 by 120 by 50. So, and it, the distortion function of the grading, you know, if you add another plane on this, you keep the same optic. So, I mean, distortion function. So, and, and you know, if, if you put the camera out in the sides here, you actually have the whole world. They're just depressed, right? They're probably 10 times the light. So when we did that, the bright field imaging, you know, if we move the camera, we're like, oh, there's the third order. Yeah, so you, you, have, you have more orders. But squeezing that in space, it's not that hard. And also, like the panel for the schematic distortion correction. This is where we're at right now. I think it would be hard to make it really, really big unless you you cut back a little bit on your on your NA. This might be a dumb question, but could you imagine multiplexing this type of uh, emission patch splitting onto something like a light sheet with multiple sheets at the same time to try to speed up? So Hori asked me that before, and I was like, I don't know, man, and please try it out. And I think he did. So I think Hori should answer that question. Uh, <laughs> Take I mean, the mic. I think the, the issue is that you have like, a, you're still going to have the out of focus contribution plane, but I mean, the principle you could come in with the out of focus formation to match the. So this, this is a wide field method, right? And I think if you put SIM on it, you get that kind of optical sectioning property. Um, it's, it's yeah, and again, it comes back to that scale that you mentioned because a lot of time when you do light sheet, your light sheet is maybe one, two, three microns, right? It's not super narrow. If you put a light sheet on this system, I think that would be absolutely beautiful. Uh, you lose a little bit of the point because the point here is you get everything at once, and if you do the light sheet, you don't. But there are probably some some weird ways that you could make use of that. Somebody has to miss. <laughs> Never. Uh, what is the lateral resolution that you need for the fabrication of the grid? So that's a compli complex question because so the, the features are 12 microns. Let me go to the features. The problem is if you change the shape of those features by a few hundred nanometers, then you're going to get a different function, right? 
So you can simulate that quite easily, what would happen with a certain error in MATLAB. So you just put this in as a phase grading, meaning all of this is one, all of this is minus one, plus minus pi phase. And you do the Fourier transform of that and you take the square of the absolute value and you get what distribution mm -hmm. here, right? Uh, and then you can also put that through the whole ray tracing. So, so yeah, I mean, and this one, I mean, for the multi-phase grading, you have very little tolerance. The Heidelberg DWL laser writer writes with 100 nanometer resolution, then that is five times minified by the ASLM stepper in the DPUD lithography step. Yeah. So it's, it's fine stuff. You can make, you know, you can print something in photoresist, you can use a chrome mask, you can do because, all this. Because I know this printer with polymers on glass, Oh, okay. So, so things like that size nanoscribe. Yeah, the nice yeah. thing is that uh, you can control the refractive index with the epoch exposure yeah. time, right? The problem you run into with those is that those are made for making very tiny things. These gradings are kind of big. The smallest one we make is four millimeters. I see. Yeah. By the time you print at a four millimeter area, they will shrink. You so. are distorted. Uh, so we, we went and tried the nanoscribe and what happened was we made it, we made resolution targets for uh, space photography with it. So the nanoscribe is awesome. Like we made this little beautiful target. We put silver on them. We used them as 3D photography targets for this sand imaging and space camera that one of my students made. Yeah. So that it's a cool tool, but the, the, it's the same why we don't use e-beam lithography, right? So you have fantastic resolution in the resist with that. But if you're going to print an area that big, it just doesn't, the tool doesn't do that. Yeah, good. Yeah, okay. but it's cool, right? And you could you could make some other, it's just the Fourier plane has a certain size. And the smaller I, it is, the harder it is to align it, right? <laughs> we need. Yeah. Um, maybe can I, can I ask a question? Please. Yeah. Hi. You, yeah. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Sarah. Yeah, um, great work, really. Um, I, I love the method. Um, I think my question was a little bit towards what you just mentioned before regarding Harry's question or comment, which is how free are you in sort of extending the axial um, depth of this method, right? Is it completely freely adjustable if you don't care about diffraction limited sampling and set, but you just want to make this? So again, I, I don't know, because the thing is that the light has to go through the microscope objective. So at some point, you're going to start vignetting. And I thought we would hit that with a two micron grading period with a 550 micron, 120 nanometer, or sorry, micrometer area, but we didn't hit it yet. So somebody's gonna have to try it, you know, to make it even bigger. Because that system there, that, that's the biggest one we've made. And, and we still didn't go into it. But at some point, you know, this beam, this defocused beam from the objective, it's gonna start vignetting someone somewhere in here. And when that happens, you don't get the light out of the objective anymore. So even if this optic can hypothetically defoc refocus any beam that's coming in here with a different wavefront, that beam has to pass through the objective first. At some point, this distortion function would also kind of go, uh, go out, right? So yeah. there's probably a limit to how much you could distort here, but that you, it's not as much of a problem because I mean, the higher orders each get, like if you use the third order, you get three times the focus of this one. So I think that one we probably won't hit. And if we hit, we can think of a way around it. But yeah, how much can you get through the objective? I think there's actually quite some, um, some value in thinking about maybe not always diffraction limited imaging, but as, as, as you have previously remarked, right? Maybe thinking of lower NA, but just really pushing a, the, the volume to cover more. And especially in yeah. set. We're all in our little world, right? Some people's world is this tiny and some people's world is a little bigger. My world has been like cell nucleus, maybe C. elegans embryo, right? Maybe even C. elegans. And then it's like, oh, it's getting really big now. But yeah. Good, yeah, no, thanks a lot. Hey, I see Mark in the wilderness has his hand up, right, Mark? Uh, yeah, thanks, Brian. Yeah, I'm out in Maryland for retreat. Um, I, I really like the pixel flipper approach. It's, it's very simple and elegant. Um, I'm wondering, though, have you been able to get any insight about refraction grading design from that? One more time. What was the question? 
I was wondering if you were able to gain any mathematical insight from the results of your pixel flipper. Oh, I see. Program. I mean, so it's all about symmetry and Hermitian conjugates. Uh, and the way you put together phase gratings is that the multi-phase gratings, they, they kind of are shapes laid on top of each other. And I mean, diffraction is going in two directions always, right? So if I have a, a, an edge here, it's going to spread light up and down. If I'm edge like this, it's going to spread like diagonally like that. And, and it's a combination of these edges in the image that create the pattern, right? So for example, this pattern here is an oval, right? Combined with a kind of thing like that, which is sort of like this thing, except this as this piece is smaller. And what you're trying, I mean, it depends entirely on what geometry you want out. So everything is, is corner-wise symmetrical. So you put, this is basically multiple gradients put together. And it was funny because there was a researcher here, Janelia, who said, I don't want your nine focal planes. I want seven because the last and the first, they never have anything in it. And I said, well, sure. Then we take this pattern, like this little oval, because this, this oval is a seven plane function. So that's diagonally symmetrical like this so that there's nothing here and here. So uh, I haven't been able to formalize that in any way. It's mostly, it's a, it's a beautiful geometry. After a while, you get an intuition for it. But what this algorithm does, it's simply looking for a local minimum of whatever target function you make. If the target function is a Pokemon animal, you're going to look until you find this Pokemon animal that you display. If it's seven planes, nine planes, 25 planes, uh, if it's, I mean, it can be anything, right? It really can be anything because it's diffractive. It's, it's beam splitting. Uh, but but, but um, if you want it to not be hermitian conjugate, it's going to be messy. So it's symmetry. The, um, you mentioned local minima, and I'm wondering, do you feel solutions that are very different from each other? Or, or is this one class of solution that you typically find? What I'm I'm sorry you're breaking up a little bit. That I didn't get the question. Did anyone? Uh, I think if you ask us, so this the, is the, the question unique is, solution. Are, 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 yes. Yes. Are there classes of solutions that give the same pattern, or is it a unique pattern? Uh, I mean, in a sense, yeah. I mean, this oval, right? You put this oval on in different directions, and then you build from what that gives. Add what this gives. Um, but I, I'm, I haven't been able to formalize that and I don't know anyone who has. Joseph Mate, who's in Maryland, wrote a paper on this where he proved that this was the most, this was actually the, the global minimum of this function. But he also didn't formalize, you know, how, why, why is that? So for me, it's art. Uh, if somebody can formalize this, that would be fantastic. I have a question about data throughput with your camera array. And is that a challenge? And how do you synchronize? Is it easy to synchronize those? No, no it's not. If you ever want to build something like this. Uh, so my students are electrical engineers, thankfully. So Ed and Anton, those two guys, it took them, I don't know how long to get these 25 cameras running synchronized at 160 hertz. And they talk to Nico Sturman a lot. and. Biohub is now thinking about how to do that because that's where my student is now. And they're like, man, you guys, you came up with a really good thing here. So evidently, whatever they built, which included a PSOC that they built themselves, a programmer will uh, system on chip. Um, so, so all of that is on GitHub. So I don't understand it. I could never do it myself. It's but, super impressive. But yeah, they are. And, and from a data handling perspective? Uh... Data handling was much easier than we thought because um, there is that we thought we would have to build two computers and have half the cameras in each, but it actually works with all the, uh, we, we write raw files. ImageJ can open raw files. You just put the raw file into ImageJ and tell it when it cuts off between images and it can read it. So we write raw files and sure, it's a lot of data, it's terabytes in a couple of hours, but <clears throat> thanks to that acquisition engine, it really works. And that's, that's, that's a lot of work that those kids spend on that. I think I could never do it. You should talk to those kids if you ever want to build something with more than four cameras. <laughs> you should just hit them up and be like, hey, what did you do? Is there anyone in the audience who's tried that? People are like giggling a little bit in the back. <laughs> I guess Ragav comes closest, right? Yeah? Yeah. So again, they use Napari as the uh, user interface. 